Let me close on this. Yeah, so evening, everyone. Thanks for coming along to tonight's talk slash presentation slash question and answer kind of thing, I would imagine. Uh, tonight, Simon M0GZP has very kindly offered uh, to give us a talk on his experience uh, in astrophotography, um, capturing, well, images essentially or from, from space using signals in the 420-ish terahertz, I think, mm -hmm. say 420, 750. Um, so I think you've got a presentation for us. So without further ado, I'm more than happy to pass over to yourself. Okay, cool. I'll just share my screen or try to. This worked earlier, so hopefully it will work now. It That's is that indeed. Look. Yeah, all good. Uh, okay, so something odd happened to my screen now, but uh, there we go. I can't see my uh, thing that I'm presenting. Ah, here we go. It was just taking a while to come up. Right. So, hi. Yeah, this presentation, like I said, is entitled, uh, like uh, Frank said, was is entitled uh, Capturing the 428 750 terahertz signals. Um, which is really kind of cheating, but uh, we'll get into that. It's about you know astrophotography in in what I call light polluted London because that's where we live. I like to start presentations off with a quote, so here's a quote. Um, this is from Plato in the Republic. Would you believe um, astronomy com astronomy compels the soul to look upwards and leads us from this world to another. Um, Astronomy is a hobby I've been interested in for many, many years. Um, way back when I used to point uh, film cameras up at the sky and had a little um, mount that was uh, driven by um, me turning a little handle that made the camera turn along with the skies and take uh, really, really, really bad images. Um, and it's, I think it's an amazing hobby. Um, Here's a little slide about me. Um, I'm just another radio ham. There are my various call signs. I'm currently M0GZP. Um, previously, I've been 2E0LHR based on London Heathrow because I used to travel for a living. I used to do a lot of uh, um, flying around the world and uh, M6IBM, so you can guess who I work for. Um, I'm an soft, uh, was Before becoming a radio ham, I uh, was interested in radio for uh, quite a while and I'm not going to sort of go into what's there, but I've been, like I say, an amateur astrophotographer for, a lot, for, for many years. Um, when digital cameras became uh, something that was feasible for the normal person to buy, that's when things really changed for me. Um, and I work in uh, IT security nowadays for the past five years or so. I've been working full time from home. Um, but uh, like I said before, that I used to travel a lot. Um, I'm aiming this presentation at what I hope is a technical audience. So you guys are radio hands. I'm not going to sort of go particularly slowly because you, you should be sharp and technical. Um, I'm hoping that you're an interested audience. Um, and by that, I mean no one has to be watching this if they don't want to. So um, what I'm really hoping for is difficult questions. I want you to be a difficult audience. So I mean that very seriously. You know, I'm, I'm an amateur when it comes to astrophotography in the same way that you're all amateurs when it comes to radio. Um, I love difficult questions. I love things that make me think and understand the hobby in different ways. Some of the best discoveries that are out there come from people that are just starting to think about a given subject. So if you take one deeply technical person from one hobby and you introduce them to another hobby, they can ask questions that really turn the hobby around and become completely invaluable. So I'm hoping for questions and stop me if um, if if there are any. Why are we here? Um, I don't mean that philosophically, of course. What I mean is um, I was talking on the net one day and um, uh, I'm a member of the Radio Society of Harrow, who I originally put this for, uh, to, and it was a Radio Society of Harrow net G3FX. Um, and I mentioned astrophotography and people got interested. And because I think it's a hobby that really complements uh, amateur radio, I thought it'd be fun to sort of try and put together a presentation which discusses it in a way that radio hams will understand. I'm not trying to teach you everything there is to know about astrophotography. In fact, this is probably not a very good introduction into astrophotography itself. It's just me rambling, going on about um, my thoughts on astrophotography and showing you some of the pictures that I've taken. Um, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. So any questions before I start? 
talking. Okay, this isn't going to be the most interactive of presentations, I see. <laughs> it's always difficult when you're presenting over uh, over Zoom and in the virtual world. So um, I'm assuming that there'll be people watching this back over YouTube and so on. So um, feel free to get in touch if you have questions as we go along. I was going to say, if, uh, if people do have questions and they don't want to interrupt, feel free to use the text chat and I'll pull them out at an appropriate point for you, Simon. Perfect. Thank you for that, Rank. Okay, so t different types of astrophotography. Astrophotography, we typically split up into two main genres, um, which are things that are within our solar system. That's the planets, that's solar astrophotography, i.e. looking at the, the uh, images of the sun, lunar, um, uh, asteroids, any, anything that's within the scope of our solar system. And then what we call deep sky astrophotography, or some people call deep space astrophotography, um, which are basically galaxies, nebula, anything outside the solar system. Different types of astrophotography require different um, equipment. And personally, all of my gear is um, focused very much on deep sky astrophotography. Um, and I'll show you some of the gear that I use uh, later in the presentation. Um, here are a couple of images of galaxies out in the face, out in the region of space. So here we have my first ever digital astrophotograph photograph. So this was the first time I got a, a digital camera. It was a Canon EOS 50D, um, and I got a, a, a telescope. I got a mount. I pointed it up at the stars. I worked out how to get everything together, and I took this. And it is an awful photograph. You could. This is uh, Andromeda. The uh, the Andromeda galaxy known as Messier Object 31. Um, there are all sorts of problems with it. The, the center is completely blown out. You can just see a big white spot. Um, the calibration is all over the place. The corners you can see are sort of glowing. It's a it, low res resolution. There's noise. It's, it's a terrible photograph, but it was the first astrophotograph I ever took. And it was from light polluted London, which has really bad light pollution. So, you know, it's, it's not great, but I was proud of it. This is an, an image of a galaxy. Here's a slightly more recent one. So these are two separate galaxies. They're called the Cigar Galaxy and Bode's Galaxy, uh, M81 and M82. So the Cigar Galaxy is here on the left-hand side. You can see it's sort of shaped like a cigar. On the right-hand side, you've got Bode's Galaxy. Um, this was taken user, using a dedicated astrophotography camera, a um, apochromatic triplet refractor from the same location, but with better equipment, with more experience and with better processing. So this is a, you know, an example of, a, of an amateur astrophotograph of a galaxy. I've dabbled in lunar photography and planetary photography. Here's a couple. This is one of my images of the moon and an image of Jupiter. Um, the image of Jupiter was taken using the same telescope that took this um, uh, image of, uh, of Andromeda, but using a different camera um, and some uh, other bits and pieces. And the image of the moon here was taken just using a DSLR on a, on a static uh, tripod um, and uh, taking a few images and linking them together. But this isn't really what I focus on. It's, uh, this is just dabbling that um, I played with. So. Before we get into showing pretty pictures, I wanted to talk a little bit about theory because, you know, as radio hams, we're all technical people. So I wanted to sort of call out what it is we're actually capturing here. Um, you saw I called my presentation, I named it after the, 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 the frequencies, um, of the radio frequencies that I'm actually capturing. And that was a bit of a misnomer because visible light is basically those uh, radio frequencies. That's just another way of saying the things that our eyes can see. Visible light is just a part of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum. So humans can detect that pretty well with these, um, you know, the, these detectors that we have built in above our noses. Um, it's in between ultraviolet light, which most people can't see, and infrared light, which most people can't see. And the actual wavelength is 300 uh, nanometers, 700 nanometers. So, um, uh, you know, you, 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 all you people who talk about your, your use of gigahertz wavelength uh, radio as being, you know, really, 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 really short wavelength, that's nothing compared to what I'm capturing here. Um, Usually in astrophotography, we talk in terms of the actual wavelength rather than the frequency. So me putting this 428 to 750 was kind of cheating. No one really talks that way. But I thought it was interesting that uh, this is the point at which the wavelength and the 
fre uh, frequency in terahertz kind of uh, come close to each other in magnitude. So 300, 700, 428, 750. That's completely coincidental, um, or that's the way the, the universe was created. You know, one or the other of those is true. So that's what we're capturing. We're looking at the visible spectrum. And like I said, the human eye is the receiver that we use for these uh, emissions. What we're actually seeing is we see red, which is roughly 580 to 700 nanometers. We see green, which is 490 to 580 nanometers, and blue, which is 400 to 490 nanometers. And what happens is our eyes merge the colors together into a composite image, which has lots and lots of different shades. And that's why we can see lots and lots of different colors on different parts of the spectrum. Um, this is all, you know, scientifically, it's this, this isn't um, absolutely dead on. This is kind of a, 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 a high level summary ish of, uh, of uh, what's going on. So, you know, feel free to, to, to call me out on, uh, uh, on, on the details, but this is kind of more or less how it works. How do we actually collect light? Well, here is some equipment that I've got. This actually is a little out of date because since I presented this in March, um, every single piece of the equipment here is actually changed that's quite funny i'll show you some equipment some of the equipment later maybe on a uh, from the uh, uh, from a photo so but what we have here is a, a, a german equatorial mount uh, skywater eq6 there's a big refractor telescope of vixen ax 103s um, uh, we have a camera which is the purple thing on the end of the telescope there then there's a filter wheel in front of the camera um, then there, in which there are various filters um, which are filtering the light and only allowing specific uh, frequencies to go through to the center. Um, there's a mini PC underneath the, the, the telescope there, there's an automatic focuser and so on. So I'll explain some of these bits. Um, you can see that this is all powered from the little green box that's over there that contains a um, uh, uh, lithium uh, LIFEPO4. What, how do you say that? LIFEPO4, lithium ferro, whatever it's called, uh, battery that I um, built and put in a box so it runs there. That's got about, uh, I think, 60 amp hours or so, which runs the whole setup easily for a night. What's all that stuff do? Well, the most important part is this thing called the German equatorial mount. And the idea here is that this compensates for the Earth's rotation. So the Earth is, is, is twisting around the pole. You've got, if you think of a line from the North Pole to the South Pole, the Earth is constantly going uh, twisting around that axis. When we have our German equatorial mount, we point the mount in the same line. So it's directly parallel to the polar axis going from the North to the South Pole, pole i.e. it's pointing directly at the pole. And it's got a little stepper motor in it, which as the Earth turns one way, the stepper motor is turning the other way to counteract the motion of the Earth. And that's what lets us do long exposure astrophotography. Yeah? If um, we didn't have something like this countering the turning of the Earth, then the stars would be leaving a trail, like this little image that's down here. This isn't one of my images. So this is just stolen from uh, the internet somewhere. But this shows you what trails look like if you just point um, the camera directly at the stars. And you can see that the thing that's in the foreground, these hills, um, are perfectly well exposed because they're not moving. What's moving are the stars in the sky above. And in fact, it's not the stars moving, it's the Earth moving, which is what's giving us this. So that's what the, 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 the mount is giving us. It's counteracting the motion to enable long exposure astrophotography. How long do I mean by long exposure? Well, some of my images include upwards of 30 hours of exposure. So that the telescope is pointing at the same part of the sky with the same camera recording the images for you know, 30 hours. Now, obviously, that happens over multiple nights. It's not um, 30 hours nonstop because that big star called the sun would get in the way. Um, uh, although it'd be kind of cool if you got on an aeroplane and somehow counted the, no, sorry, never mind. It, you do this over multiple nights and um, uh, collect all of this data together. So individual frames called subs um, uh, can be from a few seconds to you know half an hour just pointing at the time. And then you add all of the data together programmatically using a process called stacking. And there's specialized software that enables you to do that. Um, and remember that the mount's compensating for the movement of the earth. And that's why we can take these images that are, you know, 30 seconds to 30 minutes or even longer we've got yeah. three questions already i don't know whether you'll cover them absolutely up. no no go with it um, go with the questions Help so the questions vic vic you can unmute yourself i'm sure you can ask that 
Yeah, sure. Uh, what about the weather? What about the dust? Oh. Dust on the on the on the dry days and uh, yeah. drizzle and the cloud and stuff. The weather is the astrophotographer's nightmare, especially living in this lovely island that we live in. Um, in fact, the typical process for astrophotographers in England is they get really into astrophotography, get into the hobby, and then start sulking about the weather, and then either give up the hobby or they buy a remote um, uh, astrophotography setup. Um, that they set up somewhere in Chile, for example, or somewhere that um, you know has has good weather all the time and good conditions for astrophotography, um, and and just run their setups remotely over the internet from that. Um, so yeah, the weather has a big um, uh, effect. It's even when it's seemingly clear, then we have things like uh, what we call seeing astrophotographic photographic seeing, where the atmosphere diffract the light as it um, is coming in and makes it harder for us to pick up um, details. So it's, it's, it's a complicated subject, but it's a great question. Uh, what other questions do we have, Frank? Yeah, uh, passing comment, what will flat earthers say about the spiral image? Yeah, <laughs> that's a random one. So, so one from myself, actually. Um, mm -hmm. You said you have to record it over several nights. Mm -hmm. The Earth's position in space relative to the rest of the universe, I assume, changes over the course of a few days. Um, it does. Do you have to accommodate for that, or is it kind of insignificant? If you're taking an image of something relatively close, um, then things change, and yes, you potentially do. Um, that's more relevant for things like planetary and the moon. If you're taking images of something that's uh, many, many light years away, the small movements of the Earth, relatively small, because obviously it's huge, but uh, relative to the rest of the universe, um, uh, tend to make no real difference. Um, we're talking the sky changes in terms of multiple human lifetimes. So if you go back, you know, 200 years, the skies would be different to, the, to how they are now. But in terms of over a couple of nights um, for the kind of astrophotography that I do, um, it's not necessarily an issue. That said, there are people who deal with um, uh, photometry, which is a, the study of, uh, 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 of uh, or, or a more scientific study of uh, of the skies uh, in, in astrophotography. Excuse me, and the kind of details that they're interested in. Um, they need to be much more precise um, and it can be an issue but then they don't necessarily have to take 30 hours worth of images over yeah. you know over the course of a week it makes lots of sense. Take, a, sorry, lot of, a lot of the science of trying to understand the composition size of a, a planet that you hear tends mm -hmm. to be because of the the impact of the biggest body in that system that it has on the planet and they're always looking at minute changes in it from what they can see which is always really interesting how can they get that confident in it uh theodore had a a, a question that's kind of seems to be related mm -hmm. uh Don't which was um the use of lasers for calibration on uh, is it something that's i, I think you said in the domain of big telescopes only or is it something that could be used I, on no I, I i use a laser to calibrate one of my um, uh, telescopes i've got a, a smith cassegrain <laughs> telescope which has a, a two two point three five meter focal length um, which is uh, made up of multiple um, uh, mirrors in a reflector scenario and i use a a, a laser and and some other equipment to to calibrate uh, to um, collimate that to make sure that the mirrors are pointing in the right direction very very precisely and so on so you know lasers are used absolutely awesome in, uh, cool. in the amateur world as well that's it for now anyone else is welcome to interrupt whenever but i'll keep um, absolutely yes yeah, yeah. stop stop me at any time don't 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 feel that they have to sort of um all batch up into into attack i'm i'm happy to you know this this is a passion for me i'll happily talk about it <laughs> until the cows come home and answer any questions as best i can so awesome so the stepper motor um, uh, that we use for this um, uh, mount that's countering the action of the Earth has to be pretty precise, doesn't it? Well, actually, it does, but um, we can't afford, uh, as amateur astrophotographers, stepper motors that are really that precise. 
Um, if you have a top-end astrophotography mount and the, the motor itself is so precise that it and it has, um, you know, uh, digital encoders which are keeping the motors very specific, very much on track, and it's got really high-quality gears and bearings, and it can expose for hours and counteract the Earth perfectly. The cheapskates among us, i.e. astrophotographers like me, can't afford those kinds of mounts. And when I say can't afford those kinds of mounts, we're talking uh, in the tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds um, is the kind of price for the, for a kind of mount that can do um, uh, that kind of unguided long, uh, long, long exposure imaging. Less expensive mounts um, have to use various techniques to compensate. So you remember, I'll scroll back quickly to, uh, or try to scroll back. Um, here, you see that little telescope that's on top of the telescope, and that little camera that's on top, uh, plugged into the telescope that's on top of the telescope. This is what we call, to call a guide camera and a guide telescope. So what we do is we set up that um, uh, guide camera, and we point it through that guide scope at a star. And it's looking at this star constantly. It's taking short images every couple of seconds, maybe every half a second, every three, four, five seconds. And if that star moves, it knows that we've lost precision and therefore it instructs the mount, oh, you've moved a nanometer in this direction, you want to turn back that direction. So it sends these tiny little pulses to the mount to keep it directly on time. And if we didn't do this, then our images would be all blurry because things would be moving around. Does that make sense? It's, it's kind of hard to explain until you've actually played with it for a while, but this is the best explanation I can give. You know, this, so, this is how, how we make it realistic for us. Go ahead. So then you have a uh, stepper motor in two axes, right? Oh yes, well, it's so I, I cheated a little by not explaining what an equatorial mount actually is, um, because it has two axes, but it's not quite um, uh, up, down, left, right. It's got one axis which tracks the movement of the Earth, and um, we call it the right ascension axis, and then we have one axis which tracks the declination, so it's uh, um, uh, north to south. Um, and yes, it's it's moving in in two axes so that it can have uh, it can move in any direction effectively our comparison would be a phase lock loop in, in a tuning circuit um you your feedback loop is the pointing at the star and finding the difference and then injecting that difference into your main uh, into your main frequency and exactly it on. correct yeah I exactly to make it uh, yeah a absolutely um perfect analogy there robin what does german stand for in that name is it the germans gem <laughs> yeah the germans came up with it oh, okay oh, that's the equatorial mount <laughs> I, yeah. I was almost certain that was going to be your answer, but <laughs> <laughs> almost certain. Yeah. Um, you know, I may just be assuming that I just realized I don't actually know that for a hundred percent certain. Wow. Someone Google that quickly. And then I am, I'm, I'm on wrong. it. <laughs> Thanks Frank. <laughs> um, okay. So why do exposures need to be so long? This is a slide I call buckets and rain. Light from distant galaxies and from nebula out there is very, very faint. So when we have a camera sensor, the camera sensor is made up of lots and lots of ind individual pixels, and these pixels are capturing photons. What we mean by that is, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a radio signal, it's a photon that's coming in, it hits a photoreceptive sensor, and then the sensor converts that into electrons, which we can then turn into data, store as data and turn into images. You can think of these pictures, uh, pixels, each of these pixels as a separate bucket. So if you think of lots and lots of buckets laid out on the ground next to each other, and then there's a rainstorm coming down, and that rainstorm is all the photos, photons coming down from space. Now, you'll notice that where there's more rain, the buckets will fill up faster. Where there's less rain, the buckets emptier, okay? And to take this the analogy further, the number of pixels recorded, when we turn those into um, uh, a number, uh, we use some, uh, a simple ADC, uh, analog digital converter, that gives us the intensity of the light in a pixel. So if, if you think of a bucket that's 100% full, that would be, let's say we have a range of zero to 255, a full bucket would be 255, a half full bucket would be 128 and so on. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah so yeah. Ah, here we go i drew i've got an image the, this these images were stolen from someone by the way i didn't uh, uh draw these so 
there's our bucket. Incoming light um, you know, fills up to a certain point, and there's the electrons that we've gathered in the pixel bucket. If you've got more uh, a bucket that's more full, that's a brighter pixel, i.e. it's um, you know, this may be 200 on the scale from 0 to 255. If it's less full, it's a dimmer pixel, so this may be sort of, uh, I don't know, 60 or something on the, on the same scale. Yeah? Is that making sense, yeah? Yeah, yeah, because each cool. pixel mm -hmm. captures the same photon, if you like. No, photons each in one's capturing pixel. different sets of different photons. So it's yeah. because it's in a slightly different location, and the photons come in. It's this is radio. Remember, this is yeah. That, 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 that's what that's what I'm meaning here. Yeah. Right. Each pixel is is if you like each pixel is is capturing the same photon. Although we know it's not the same photon, it's on the same direction from the same mm -hmm. source. So you add up those photons. That's all you're doing. You're adding up. It's a it's a summing effect of every every exposure. If you like. Exactly. So let let's say that 200 photons fall on this pixel and only 60 fall on this pixel. This pixel will be brighter than that one because more of it has come down. You know, you can almost think of it as dabbing paint. If you if you were to draw, you could draw an image by having a paintbrush and dabbing paint. And if you dab the brush six times in one spot, it's gonna be brighter. And you only dab it twice in another spot, it's gonna be duller. And you could imagine using that to paint an image. At yeah. the sort of bit rate you're talking about though, does noise become a factor? How oh, do you distinguish what's a legitimate pixel from, from a piece of noise? It absolutely does. I think I talk about noise a little later in this, but it, that may have just been a conversation that we had. If I don't, then please pull it up um, a, a little later, Simon, okay? I have a question about the spectra. Do you, Go ahead. Is it a multispectral camera or can you only have one wavelength at the time? It's a great question and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And this is good, by the way. The, the questions that um, uh, 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 that I, I turn around and say we'll talk about that in a little bit mean that they're absolutely spot on questions because I've anticipated and asked them. So um, if if I don't answer it properly, then answer uh, then um, uh, pester me afterwards. Okay. So buckets of photos. Here we have a single 120 second exposure of of uh, a, a spinal galaxy called NGC 4258. Um, I've kind of used some uh, imaging image processing techniques to stretch this so that um, uh, the uh, details are slightly more visible but the idea is basically that the brighter pixels are where the buckets are more full and the darker ones are where they're more empty so you can see this is the very beginnings of an astrophotograph yeah does that make it sort of clearer yeah right so that's monochrome haha -ha. here was the question about um, uh monochrome Th this this image here isn't really monochrome this is what we what i would call multichromatic it's um taken using what i'd call a luminance filter and a luminance fixed filter allows through all of the wavelengths in visible light all of the ones that we're interested in so it's basically just just like a radio filter um has a, a specific band pass this has a band pass of 400 to 700 uh, nanometers so all of those color wavelengths come in and they're, they're they come in together and that's why we have white um, uh, white, black and white, as it were. But this is actually multi-chromatic. So how do we take color images? Well, what we do is we use separate filters for red and green and blue, and we combine them in the same way that our eyes do that in the real world. Yeah, it's the, they are, the eyes are capturing all of these frequencies and they see the three different colors and combine them together. Well, so do that, that's exactly what we do with um, our color filters. So. Here's another image. Um, uh, I took these images um, uh, just before this presentation. It was like the week before these presentations. These aren't particularly good images. I just wanted to um, use some examples that I uh, put together myself. So this is, isn't a particularly good image, but it shows how we build a color image. What I've done is I've got three filters, one blue filter, which is from about 400 to, there's a bit of overlap between them, but about 400 to 500, 500 to uh, 580 is green, and then 580 to 700 also is red, more or less. And here are the three monochromatic images. So that's showing only the red wavelengths, that's showing only the green wavelengths, that's showing only the blue wavelengths. And then I map them into the channels, um, into a red, green and blue channel, and look how it turns out. We suddenly see color because it's mixing the three different um, uh, parts of the spectrum and seeing you know, what values there are and that's where we get the color from. 
Does, does that make sense? Again, I'm not very good at explaining color. Yeah, one more question. Uh, does does commonly are used only those free filters, or uh, can you use anything else, or is it common to use uh, any other filters? Because, there for is, example, with yeah. regular photography, I used extra uh, infrared to mm -hmm. catch up uh, the clouds on a sunny day. Uh, absolutely. So. Um, in, in the terms of infrared, that would be rarely used for deep sky. Um, infrared is actually a very good filter for guide cameras. So you remember how I said the guide camera is looking directly at a star. Um, infrared as a frequency tends to be less affected by, astro astro um, uh, by atmospheric seeing. So if you put an infrared filter on your guide camera, it can see the stars better and therefore give more precise adjustments to your mounts. So that's one use of infrared. Um, for example, but we also use um, uh, filters which are much narrower bandwidth than this, um, and I'll get into that a little later in the presentation. How am I doing for time, by the way? We've done about halfway through. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, very good. Half, half exactly halfway through. Um, random question again: Is there any benefit to capturing pho uh, photons that are maybe in the ultraviolet or higher uh, um, to get a yes. interesting image? To, so, from the point of view of capturing specific, um, of capturing red, green, and blue colors, not necessarily. From the point of view of um, uh, capturing specific emissions out there that happen to be in those frequencies, absolutely. Um, and there's all sorts of things that the scientists do that are interesting, which aren't necessarily astrophotography, but they are spectrometry. That there's spectrometry. Is that the right word? They are there. This is science. This is you know out of my field. I'm a. I'm just an amateur guy who likes pretty pictures. When it comes down to it, the clever people who, um, that that do all of this kind of science. But to give you an example, the James Webb Space Telescope, which has just recently made the news, um, uh, had been making the news for for quite a while. That's almost entirely in infrared. So its images uh, don't use red, green, and blue at all. They use infrared. Um, because of the way that it cuts through space, and I, I don't remember all the details. Um, I may be waffling a little bit here, so feel free to, to you know, correct no, me um, it, it, uh, later because it's not my my area of expertise. So um, I'm just going to move my desk into a uh, standing position because I uh, I had uh, spinal surgery back in November, two big operations because um, I was in a wheelchair for about six months before that. Oh, crikey. Has that just destroyed my hand? No. <sighs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. So many questions as we're going. So yeah, if anyone else has come up with any questions as we're running through, feel free to put them in text chat and um, I'll happily grab them or keep interrupting as you go. Um, right, I'm hold up again. Yep. Okay, good, sorry about that. Um, this is a new computer as well, so I haven't really um, had time to look at the cables, um, but I just need to stand for a little while while I'm presenting, so my apologies. Um, Right, let's, were there any other questions? No, all good to keep going at this point. Good, okay, let's go. So, um, why do we need these filters? So one of the main reasons from a, a, a red, green, blue sort of uh, image point of view that we use the filters um, is because we don't actually want the extra infrared and ultraviolet data because it's gonna bloat um, uh, the images that we actually pick up on the sensors. The sensors that we use um, tend to be CMOS, complementary metal oxide, uh, metal oxide sensor, I think it just stands for actually. Um, uh, although we used to use an older technology called CCD, uh, which stands for charge coupled device. Um, and the sensors that we, that, that we use are actually sensitive in a, quite a wider range than um, just the red, green and blue. So if we were to pick up, for example, infrared and ultraviolet, then the amount of um, uh, light that we pick up from those extra emissions would uh, mean that uh, the stars, uh, we, we'd pick up more data than uh, is, is just inside the red, green, and blue because the sensor is actually picking up from outside the bandwidths. 
just going back over those words. Do those make sense or did I get a little confused there? No, no, no. That was yeah. OK, good. good. So um, this little diagram that you can see on the thing here is, is, is what we call a quantum efficiency chart. So the sensor basically will, um, uh, the, the, the manufacturer of a sensor will basically publish um, data. Oh, crikey. It's just died again, hasn't it? No, your microphone's uh, just suddenly not very loud. But this isn't great. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to sit down because I'm standing. <sighs> Clearly, that's stretching the microphone. Uh, stretching the cable to the uh, sound card. Right. Do that, that, and that. Right. Am I back? You are indeed. Yeah. Yeah, the, clearly that's uh, when the desk in its standing mode, it's stretching the cable to the sound card. So sorry again. So the quantum efficiency of the sensor sh basically shows what percentage of the um, uh, uh, of the data is, is collected at a given frequency. So this sensor here that's uh, displayed um, for 450 to 530 or so uh, nanometers in, in wavelength is about 90% efficient and then it sort of drops down from there but even above the the 700 750 where we're off into the infrared spectrum we're still getting 50 or 60% of the um, emissions would be registered on the sensor um, so without the filters all of those extra photons that are outside what we want would be picked up by that sensor so that's monochromatic images. I want to talk a little bit about, about uh, colour imaging, uh, sorry, colour cameras, because people talk about these uh, colour cameras and all of us have them. We're, we're, we're using a colour camera right now that's, uh, you know, looking at me and you. Um, your phones have colour cameras, DSLRs have colour cameras. Um, and a colour camera also has red, green and blue filters. But what they do is they, they have special filters which are right in front of the actual sensor on a one-to-one -one relationship with each pixel. Um, and we call this, uh, the, the, this uh, get up a Bayer matrix. Now, the idea here is that your Bayer matrix um, needs to be processed to pull out an image in a given color. So if you can look at the diagram there, you can see that there's a blue pixel, then a green pixel, then a blue pixel, and green pixel, and red pixel, and so on. And in order to turn that into a red image, for example, we'd pull out all of the red pixels. Because we're only pulling out those red, red pixels, it's a lower resolution image than if we just use the center with a red um, uh, filter in front of it without this Bayer matrix. We only get one quarter of the actual pixels in use. So it's a lower resol resolution image. Although we have mathematical text techniques like interpolation to sort of work out what the pixel should be based on the, the ones around it and, and so on. Um, you'll notice that there's twice as much green in this Bayer matrix because you've got red, blue, green, green, if you look, uh, if you look at the pixels. And the reason is, is that um, when people started making these Bayer matrices in front of digital cameras, um, they designed it like this because they made the cameras for terrestrial photographies and the earth is green. Well, it is still more or less now, maybe in 50 years it won't be anymore. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, the, that, that's why these sensors are designed for terrestrial photography um, and they, they, they're biased much more towards green. Um, if we were making a sensor, not a camera, but a sensor specifically for astrophotography, we would probably bias it towards red. We'd have probably red, green, uh, sorry, green, blue, and then two red pixels, um, because red is a much more interesting frequency. There isn't much green out in space. So here's our recap so far, and I'll stop at the end of this and just in case anyone has any questions. But here's the sort of summary so far. Electromagnetic waves come from deep space objects which are many, many light years away. To capture those emissions, we collect them on a sensor. The sensor has to be kept pointing at the same bit of sky for a long, long time. And the sensor collects photons as electrons and then it converts them via an ADC uh, into data that we can process. Multiple long expo exposures can be stacked, so can be mathematically added together into even longer images. And we filter the emissions to collect those that we, uh, that we want, which are within the color spectrum. So by filtering red, green, and blue, we can create color images. 
that's our summary so far. Is everyone with me more or less at the moment? Yeah. I've got a question. Um, so red, green and blue and visible, it's an anthropomorphic thing, right? It is, is. there, is there a, a prefer, is, does this universe have a preferred color of light? Or is it, does it change through the whole spectrum? Or is there a particular band or range where it's more prevalent? Well, that's a wonderful question because it leads on to the next topic, funnily <laughs> enough. <laughs> Victory. So, um, the, you're, you're, you're talk working well if you're leading it through, right? <laughs> that's the idea. Um, I, 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 I've biased a it a little bit by saying earlier that, um, you know, there, there's too much green in these sensors and really yeah. we would want red. That's what um, got me asking the question. Exactly. Yes. So that's, that's, that, that's done its job as it were. Um, so you take two red exposures and one blue one and one green one. There you go. Sorted. <laughs> Exactly. So um, uh, ask me that again if I don't answer in a couple of slides, okay? So I have a question about the calibration nor normalization and the frame rates, but uh, may maybe that will come up. Uh, it probably won't because it's probably more technically deeper than I was planning on going. So can we leave the calibration question to the end and we can talk about it? Sure, yeah. Cool. Um, and the reason I do that is because I want to, get, I want to go, go to some pretty pictures. Well, you've already seen some pretty pictures. You've seen some of my galaxies. But galaxy images are known as broadband images. What they show is a full color image displaying red, green, and blue. And as the comment um, just came up, that's, that's kind of anthropomorphic. It's, it's, you know, we use the red, green, and blue because that's how us humans tend to see things. Lots of deep space objects are interesting, or deep sky objects, I should say, are interesting because they produce very specific emissions. So, for example, you may have a cluster of young stars which are still forming, and they could excite hydrogen atoms, and they would emit a, a, a spectral line called hydrogen alpha, for example. Now, that emission is visible in a broadband image, but only just. It's, it's part of the broadband image because its frequency is within the frequency range of red, green, and blue. But the details effectively get lost in the noise and in the QRM of light pollution. Living in London, I have QRM both in a radio and in a light um, point of view like you wouldn't believe. So to pick those signals out, just like we do with the radio, to pick out the, more the tighter signals, we use a narrower filter. Um, these are what we call the primary narrowband emission lines. Why are these the ones that, that we use? Because interesting stuff that's out there, as we've learned from experience, shows, shows up in these frequencies. So like I mentioned here, the, the cluster of young star, uh, stars in the star-forming region of space excite hydrogen atoms and emit hydrogen alpha. Hydrogen alpha happens to be at 656 newton meters, uh, nanometers. God, newton meters? Wow, where am I going with that? Um, uh, and focusing specifically on these emission lines is a technique we call narrowband imaging. And as hams, you guys will all understand the concept there. Yeah. So we've got hydrogen alpha, sulfur two, and oxygen three are the three emissions that um, uh, are most commonly seen. Although there are many others. There's, there's um, nitrogen two is a filter that people use. There's uh, hydrogen beta, which is very similar to oxygen three. So there's all these sort of areas which in and of themselves are interesting and bring out interesting details. And I'll show you those, some of those. I, here's an example must, of one. I must ask the questions. Go Where ahead. do they get the names from? Where do we get the names of what? From? Oh, the names oh. of these emission lines from yeah. the things that they're actually emissions emitting. So hydrogen alpha is emitting. It's, it's, a, it's a spectral gas um, which is formed by hydrogen atoms being excited. So that's why it's I, cool. I kind of yeah I kind of thought that that, yeah. that could be a bit I, of... I did this years and years ago um, with a spectral grating. You excite you excite hydrogen of atoms. Lights, and it was neon two yellow two yellow stripes. Yeah, hydrogen alpha is the second lowest ground state, so it's the photon that it's emitted when it drops from three to two. Yeah. There's hydrogen zero as well, which is where it goes to its lowest ground state, but that's not interesting because it isn't anywhere. I think you can observe it, but they're all based off that Vic. They're all. And basically photons being emitted by a changing ground state if you want to get really geeky who but was speaking really just there? precise measures yeah who was speaking just there Sup, simon 
Uh, right, Simon, you're now my scientist. Congratulations. You're, you're going to be getting all the questions. Awesome. I, I've done something tangential to this around IR sensors in the past. Brilliant. That's exactly I know all the need. drop lines because we put specific windows mm. on to filter that stuff out. Because in some areas, when you get very high, things are quite bright. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So we're specifically passing these through and blocking else, everything else out because then we can produce images like this. So this is an image called the Veil Nebula. Um, it's, it's a part of space called the Veil Nebula. This is the remnant of a supernova, which was 20 times larger than sun, larger than our sun, and it blew up around 20,000 years ago. Um, and this was taken, um, I, I took a 200 millimeter camera lens. Um, I put a uh, seven nanometer uh, hydrogen alpha filter in front of it and pointed it at that part of the sky. And this is only about half an hour exposure. This isn't an awful lot of exposure, but it's a really, really bright signal. And this is kind of why hydrogen alpha is, is an interesting um, uh, emission line to capture because the contrast between it and the rest of space, you know, this can be really bright and really uh, compared to the real darkness that's out there. So the other thing to note here is that this image um, basically cut through the light pollution. You know, I image in London. Uh, I'm my QTH is a place called Sudbury on the border of Wembley and Harrow, so right next to Wembley Stadium. Um, it's really, really light polluted. We have a scale called the Bortle scale. Um, which goes from one to nine in terms of light pollution, and I'm on an eight to eight point five. So, um, you know, I have bad light pollution, but none of that light pollution was visible in here because the filter was only allowing through the seven nanometers bandwidth of hydrogen alpha. And you can get even narrower filters than this. So that's an example of a single monochromatic narrowband image. Quick question from Robert. Are these physical filters or software based? These are physical filters. This is actual glass and in fact, very expensive glass. Um, one of these bits of glass could cost a few hundred to a few thousand pounds. I was also curious if you had a sensor that was sensitive enough and reasonable conditions, mm -hmm. could you have a software filter so you could filter all of these different conditions? So um, or is it just impossible with the sensors today? The, the problem that you've got here is that you're collecting all of the data on the sensor. So the sensor is sensitive to a given range. If you think back to our graph, where is it here? That range there is the, is, is, is the range of wavelengths that this filter is sens sensitive to. So once we've captured that, there's no way of chopping and changing. It's just pouring the anything that's within this range would get into the bucket. So your pixel contains, um, uh, you know, it, it contains some drops of water which are from 450 na uh, nanometers, some drops which are from 850 nanometers, and they're all in the same bucket. You can't really sort of separate the drops of water once they've all merged together in the bucket, if you see what I mean. Unless you can do a Fourier transform on every wavelength. You know, yeah, I was no. curious. Like, you, the you, there are exotic sensors that can do it. You can do some stuff around refraction as it comes through the front, so you can capture the the, the angle basically. Mm -hmm. But you are into like hundreds of thousands of US dollar sensor territory. Yeah, and that would be you could maybe pick three or four. So and I, I, and, I, and I'd, que I'd also question the granularity of how you could separate how how you know I don't think you'd be able to do that down to a nanometer wavelength. No, you you yeah, mm -hmm. you you can basically do some wider band stuff with it. Exactly. But yeah, yeah. you you can't do anything very very clever. But there okay. is there's a lot of research around being able to do that though, doing much more on the sensor post process mm -hmm. rather than having to physically fit sensors because. If your thing's in space, think about the James Webb Space Telescope, physically changing filters is not possible. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so this is basically about maximizing your signal to noise ratio in the absolutely, given. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. So that's that's what I mean here by strong contrast. This is signal to noise ratio is, is cut way down with a narrowband image. So that's monochromatic narrowband. What about emissions nebulae in color? So the main reason we want to capture these emissions line, emission lines is to highlight the features of a deep space object, as you can see clearly here in the, uh, in the Veil Nebula. 
Using narrowband filters for hydrogen alpha, sulfur two and oxygen three, we get two reddish bits of the spectrum, because if you remember hydrogen alpha and sulfur two are up here in the red area, and one greenish bit, which is, you know, the, the oxygen three is on the border of green and blue. Displaying those together in a full RGB color palette would mean that most of the spectrum is unused, and it means that you can't really see a difference between hydrogen alpha and sulfur two. So what scientists do is they, um, uh, the, the, what the scientists um, using the Hubble Space Telescope did was they came up with this idea of creating false color images using the color to represent the emission. Yeah. So what they do is they, they create this thing called the Hubble palette, which maps the emissions where it maps the sulfur emissions to the red channel, the hydrogen alpha emissions to the green channel, and the oxygen three emissions to the blue channel. That's why we call it SHO, yeah? sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen, mapped to RGB, red, green, blue. And the idea of this false color isn't to pretend and say, look, this is what space looks like. It's to make it obvious where the different emissions lie. Does that make sense? Good, I'm getting some nods, okay. So, um, where are we? Here is the most famous image from the Hubble Space Telescope. This isn't one of mine, this is from the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah? This is on a satellite outside the atmosphere and that's why you can take images like this. Um, this image um, is called the Pillars of Creation. It's a real deep zoom in a, in a net part, of an, a, a part of a nebula called the Eagle Nebula. And it's using the Hubble palette. So in this image here, you've got sulfur two mapped to red, you've got hydrogen alpha mapped to green, you've got oxygen three mapped to blue. And you can see clearly, you know, you've got all of this oxygen three in the, in the background and then where it merges, you've got these beautiful sort of browns and golds where the red and blue mix and the green comes in. That's why we present it in this kind of color. So it's obvious where the emissions lie. Okay, so this is one from the Hubble Space Telescope. What can you do from London? <laughs> so, so I have a question. If you're Go on ahead. the enter, if you're on the Enterprise and you flew into that nebula, would that be the colors that you would see, or this is just approximation? I'm going to have to hit someone because <laughs> that that question always comes up. Um, <laughs> if you're on the Enterprise and you flew into that thing, you wouldn't be seeing um, these colors because we've mapped these the emissions that we've got there are specifically here. So if you were using your eyes and looking directly at these emissions and they were visible, you'd see these two in reddish bits and see this in a greenish bit, yeah? So if you were to then, and I, I can maybe demonstrate a bit of this later of in, in a, I've, uh, I'll open like a, a, a program and split an image up and show you what it comes up as. But if you were to look, if you're standing on the bridge of the enterprise and looking at the Eagle Nebula, and you put in a narrowband hydrogen alpha filter, you would only see a monochromatic image of that bit of the spectrum. Not, notwithstanding the fact that we can see these wavelengths, I forgot we can see these wavelengths. <laughs> so everyone can see those wavelengths, but what my point is that we're mapping these wavelengths, so the mm. HA is actually mapped <laughs> to um, uh, green. So mm. anything green in this image is actually the hydrogen alpha line, which is red. Yeah but it's yeah, yeah. displayed like this so we can use the full bandwidth of the RGB presentation medium. Yeah, so that's so what we've we, got there. We don't have green information, really. Well, the, yeah, the, there's, you know, there, there's green visible in here, but there is, you know, the oxygen Sorry, three blue. is green. Blue then, it's, we don't have blue. We're missing something. Yeah. It, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah but the, if, you, if you take those filters away and you're on the bridge of the enterprise looking out of a, out of a window, you would see something completely different because you'd have the whole spectrum that you're visible to. All we're exactly, doing here is yeah. picking out three particular frequencies. Yeah. But also not to mention the fact that um, if you were looking out of the bridge of the enterprise, you'd probably have slightly more advanced techniques to visualize things because you're in a different <laughs> timeline. So, Vic, an, an analogy is it's like wearing thermal imaging goggles. You'll see the image in luminance, but mm -hmm. it, the colors will be wrong. Exactly correct, yes. And luminance is a big thing. A, a lot of our imaging, actually, we take a luminance image and then just fill in the bits of colors, even for broadband imaging, because quick, the luminance gives the detail. So, Quick question from Robert. Um, go ahead. 
is it always SHO or do sometimes people map them differently? Yeah. So absolutely, perhaps... yeah. I've I've mapped these all completely differently. Um, I I, I like, like a palette called OSH, for example. So it's we've oh, got oxygen example. wrapped in red, <laughs> um, uh, sulfur to green and 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 hydrogen to blue, and it gives a kind of purpley look. But the point is, it's you know the the reason we're doing this isn't to, and I've, I've, I think I actually have an example of that somewhere later. Um, but again, we're not doing this to show real images. This is false color, just to display the emissions in the nebula. That's the big point. Okay, we got on questions for now. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, what can you do from London? You've got Hubble, which is 340 miles, miles above sea level, and I've got London, which is my scope here, which is 180 foot above sea level. Just like with radio narrow band filters allow you to cut out QRM, yeah? And in astrophotography, QRM means light pollution, and in London, I've got huge light pollution. So can I get anything even similar to that? Let's take a look. This is a very simple picture to start with. This was taken from my back garden. This is the horse head and the flame nebula. You can see the little shape of the horse head in the middle of the image here. It really looks like a horse head. And we call this the flame nebula because it looks kind of like a flame. This was only eight 300 second hydrogen alpha images and four 300 second oxygen three images. So it's a total of one hour of exposure. And this is combined using HOO. So it's using hydrogen in red, which is why there's a strong red cast and then oxygen for both green and blue. So if you think of it mathematically, it's the differentiation between hydrogen and oxygen, um, just um, uh, with, uh, differently in each pixel. So, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, surprisingly okay. decent detail. <laughs> Absolutely, and the reason is that this is a very, very bright nebula. This was, you know, this is a small amount of data. It was taken through gaps in clouds. It's a wholly ina inadequate image, but I wanted to show what narrowband imaging is capable of, so I pointed the, um, the scope at this and said, I'll take a, as much as I can get. It took about four hours to get this one hours of exposure because there were clouds everywhere and everything was going horribly wrong. And again, this was not long before the uh, uh, it's the first time I gave this presentation. So I just wanted to have an image to show as a sort of first off. So how so, much data? How much data is it for one hour? How much data in gigabytes? Or one three hundred second image with my current camera is about fifty megabytes. So this is about two uh, twelve. Uh, it's about six hundred me six hundred megs in total for this image. But processing that can take five to six times as much space. Yeah. The tadpole nebula. Now this is a full SHO image taken from my back garden. 42 each of 300 second frames of sulfur, hydrogen and oxygen, so a total of 10.5 hours in total combined in SHO. This is a 100 light year wide region of ionized gas and it's about 12,000 light years away from the planet Earth. And you can see these tadpoles in the middle. These here, each of them is about 10 light years across and NASA tells us that this is a site of ongoing current star formation. And that's what's letting out all of these emissions of ionized gases that I'm displaying here with the colors. So that's the Tadpole Nebula. The Flaming Star Nebula. So this again is HSS, hydrogen, sulfur, sulfur. So sulfur in the green and blue channels and hydrogen in the red, which gives it the strong red cast here. And it was 90 300 second hydrogen alpha uh, uh, frames and 48 300 second sulfur frames. So 11.5 hours of total exposure. And another, you know, this is another emission nebula, ionized gases, 460 parsecs away from the Earth. Um, Quick question from Paul. Are the, um, are the exposures for the different filter lights, are they taken at the same time or are they taken at over different periods? So that's is a it good question. So that Oh, sorry, my back's playing up again. Um, so there are different ways that it can be done. Um, I tend to try and take um, a, an entire night's worth of hydrogen, for example, and then an entire night's worth of sulfur or whatever. Um, if the conditions are, are relatively bad and I don't think I'm going to get much data, then I'll script, script through and I'll take maybe you know, two hydrogen, two sulfur, two oxygen and go round and round and repeat. Um, just so that I can start building an image with all of the all of the palette, um, but there are different you know techniques and mechanisms. 
and realistically as long as the you know as, as long as your uh, the angle of the camera and so on is all the same then you can just take data and merge it together from different nights and different times yeah cool okay so that's the flaming star nebula um the orion nebula this one's quite famous um this again was a very very short um amount of exposure it's only two hours and 15 minutes and it was taken very late in the season so this was really low in the sky um it's one of the most photographed objects out there this is only nine um uh, 300 second frames of each two hours and 15 minutes in total but i kind of like the way the detail came out um and yeah that's that's why i'm presenting it here this in the belt of Orion. The Sol Nebula. So this was captured over three nights and it was captured during a full moon. So I've already said how, um, you know, our QRM is basically light pollution. Um, the full moon is light pollution, even if you're in a really dark site. So if you go somewhere where there's no light around, it's really dark. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the Galloway Dark Sky Park up in Scotland, for example. If you go on a full moon, then you have sudden QRM, just like being in London, it can be really, really strong. But because this is narrowband imaging, again, the light pollution's completely ignored because we're looking through these really narrow filters and only picking up those bits of light, so the moon isn't visible here at all. But yeah, this is called the Sol Nebula. 28, 24, and 48, uh, sorry, 48, 24, and 48, it's a total of 10 hours of exposure. The Jellyfish Nebula, um, uh, I call this one the SSL Nebula because its uh, designation is IC443, um, but uh, this is six hours of exposure. Now this combination is different. This is HSO, so hydrogen um, uh, is mapped to red, sulfur to green, and oxygen to, to blue. And the idea here was I wanted to show that the, the, the red in the bottom left, this is all the hydrogen alpha streaming away from the nebula. And you've got the copper sort of yellowy bits here um, where the hydrogen alpha and the, the sulfur two um, sort of merge together. And just in between the two of them, you can see this little line of uh, almost purple. That purpley white bit is the really strong oxygen three uh, emission that comes out in between them. So. The Rosette Nebula. Um, so this one actually won an award um, uh, a couple of years ago when I took it. Um, and this is 16 hours of total exposure. Um, and again, it's uh, presented in SHO and it shows you that, you know, the, the, the inside part of this, uh, of, of the Rosette here is, is, is mainly oxygen three and then it sort of merges into the other emissions. And you can also almost imagine it sort of coming out and billowing out from the center. So. It's one of my favorite um, parts of the sky. I tend to image this one quite a lot just because I like it. Uh, okay. Robert's quick question. How do you line up for such a centralized shot or is it more luck than anything? So I use a piece of software called Nina. Um, it's uh, an open source uh, astrophotography suite. I'm actually one of the contributors, so uh, I help with development of it as well. Um, and um, Nina, basically orchestrates this and it's all about controlling your um, mount and telescope and camera to, to to do all of this and it's it's a complete it's a talk in and of itself um, and if you're interested then you know we, we can certainly spend some time talking more about it uh, the california nebula this is so called because uh, it's roughly the shape of california someone said so i've put it on a copy of the map of the state of California so you can see on the map why it looks like that this is a relatively short image and this is again mapped HSS so hydrogen sulfur sulfur and it's only four hours of total exposure flying dragon nebula this is one of my favorite um, items I've got a thing about dragons um, there's there's a one of these days I'm going to travel to the southern hemisphere where there's a constellation called the, the fighting dragons of Ara and I'm going to travel to New Zealand or somewhere with a telescope and spend three weeks there just imaging that because it's one of my favorite constellations in the sky but this is one of my favorites in the northern hemisphere um, and this is called the flying dragon so this is slightly different this is combined HSRGB so I took 18 shots, 300 second shots of each of red, green, and blue to create a real color red, green, blue image. Then I took 90 300 second shots of sulfur two and 240 shots of hydrogen alpha. 
and I merged all of those together where the H and S merged into the red with different levels of intensity. So it brings out the detail of those emissions within the red, green, blue image. So you can see the colours in the stars, but you can also see the detail of the hydrogen alpha and sulphur 2 together. So that's, uh, you know, that's uh, an image that I enjoyed making. And 32 hours is, is, is a lot of exposure. The Elephant's Trunk Nebula, again, it's a relatively famous one. Um, the part on the bottom left here, this little bit sticking out here, is why it's called the, uh, the Elephant's Trunk. Um, these are basically, you know, more interstellar ionized gases and dust, and 12 hours combined in uh, SHO. Uh, the Cygnus Wall, uh, another, you know, star-forming region, lots of emissions. This is six hours, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen. The Pac-Man Nebula, I played Pac-Man a lot when I was young, so I can see the sort of Pac-Man shape. You can got, you've got the mouth on the right-hand side and the gobble gobble. Um, and again, three hours and 40 minutes of exposure. I realize I've gone quite a bit over the hour, so. Um, this is called the Wizard Nebula, um, and um, you can sort of, you have to sort of squint your eyes a little bit. You've got the sort of pointy hat at the top of the wizard here, and then he's holding his hand out with a wand here pointing in that direction. You have to look really, really carefully to see the wizard's face, and there's his, you know, his hat and his eye and his nose. Um, but uh, that's another image: four hours and thirty minutes of total exposure combined SHO. Uh, the Crescent Nebula, um, which is this is seven hours. Um, I like this image, and I like the fact that it's called the Crescent Nebula. My wife uh, Viola, who's uh, she's actually licensed; she's a M6 VAC. She's a gynaecologist by profession. She calls this nebula the uterus in the sky. Once you've seen the uterus there, you can't unsee it. <laughs> That's what it looks like to her. Uh, the Dumbbell Nebula, also known as the Apple Core Nebula, um, as if someone's bitten out of a, a nebula. This was a slightly different one. So this was actually using a one-shot color camera with a Bayer matrix. And in front of that, I had a special filter which picks up, um, which, which is a narrow band filter and only allows through um, hydrogen and sulfur into the red channel and oxygen emissions, but at a relatively wide, I think it's about 30 nanometers, which comes into both the blue and the green channel. So when processing it in red, green and blue, you get a pseudo narrowband emission. Um, and that gives you um, uh, this kind of look for, you, you can then process it as if it's a HOO uh, narrowband image. Um, and this kind of thing is actually more and more popular nowadays because it's faster getting results from a single one-shot color camera. You don't have to go around changing filters and combining and processing them. So but this was, for me, it was an experiment. Uh, it's not something I do a lot of, but it was kind of uh, fun to play with. Uh, the manufacturer, Altair, had lent me one of these uh, 269C cameras so I could help fix the driver that was... Uh, uh, being used because uh, there were there were issues with it and since they lent it to me in fact it's still in my <laughs> shed at the moment because they haven't asked for it back yet um, but since they lent it to me I figured I'll take an image with it and see how it works um, there are more images um, so here's a link to my uh, astrophotography web photography website uh, astrophotos.uk so you just type that in uh, it's uh, not a particularly well-written website. I haven't put together a website for a long time, and I just spent sort of uh, two days uh, uh, a, a few months back uh, hacking something together. But uh, feel free to go to astrophotos.uk, and I've put some of my images and some uh, details about how they were taken and the equipment and so on. Um, I uh, mentioned Nina, the astrophotography suite that I use for taking a lot of these images. There's a link to the Nina website. Um, one of the things I've always wanted to do is send some of my astrophotos over to SSTV. So if anyone wants to have a bit of a play and uh, help me set that up, then uh, ping me sometime and we'll, we'll do that because I think that could be a kind of fun, uh, fun thing to do. We've got an aspiration this year to send an SSTV image across the country using people from the Discord. So cool. we may have found our image. <laughs> I might give you some source material. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, because this is being recorded, I want to make it very clear. Some of the images from the color, explaining the color spectrum, I just grabbed from Wikipedia. Some others just been borrowed from articles from the web. All of the astro photographs shown here are my own work, apart from the the one by the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's important to get those credits out there. That's all I have in terms of material. What questions do you have for me? I, so what, just oh, very briefly. What, is, what I might say is. Um, when are you going to move to North Northumberland, which is full of registered dark sites? <laughs> 
You know, my wife and I have just bought a uh, motorhome, or just bought. We've been waiting for a while to uh, for it to come from uh, uh, Italy, where it's being built. Um, so it's already delayed. But the idea of the motorhome is that we can go and live in a dark site for a, uh, for a week or so, and we don't have to actually move there and deal with actually living in Northumberland, but we can temporarily be there and get all the benefit without living there or contributing to the economy in any way. <laughs> um, so, but no, we couldn't decide whether we want to live by the sea or by in the mountains or in the countryside. So we decided this is a, a good way of getting out there with a telescope. And also I'll be using that for radio. So it'll be kind of a dual purpose motorhome. Uh, is it always RGB? Why, why not to use other palettes for this? Sorry, say again? Other, other colors. Why, why, not, why not to use other color space? Like different colors. Oh, to to process things, we do we tend to we don't just deal with uh, well, I mean we we tend to deal with RGB, but we also tend to deal with uh, CIE, so luminance with the uh, um, uh, yeah. Um, but for example, is it using for example purple or uh, pink and so other, so you get uh, you got different distribution between all RGB colors. That 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 makes you totally different uh, color space. Yeah, why, why map to red, green, and blue? Why not map to purple, I don't know, brown, and something else? Uh, <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, fun, fundamentally, the final result will be you know, whatever the final result, result is. So you can map these things. You know, we, we use all sorts of hue curves to tune and tweak the colors around. So you could start um, with the original mapping um, as, you know, in... in, in, in uh, uh, as as SHO to RGB, but it may actually turn out to be, you know, twenty two percent of uh, of of, uh, of sulfur and fourteen percent of hydrogen and twenty nine percent of oxygen in yeah. the red channel in that pixel. So it, the 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 actual mapping of uh, of of the colours doesn't give us the final image. There's a lot of work to do in processing it to come up with the representation. Because remember, with the with the kind of narrowband imaging I was presenting, this is false colour. So I'm not tied to using specific colours. I want to present it as best I can. So for me, RGB is just a, a process step. And I could just as easily use different initial mappings I because guess. that's not what I'll end up with. Does that's that make kind sense of when a... answering the wrong question? The, the no, reason no, you use RGB though is that you get full color mixing. If you used something, if you used a composite color, you wouldn't you wouldn't get the mixing effect because you wouldn't have the range. You, you're so almost you losing your bandwidth, aren't you? Because if, yeah. if, 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 if by yeah, but by... you can switch for for example for printing colors like SMIC, and then you still got quite a wide a wide range like RGB. Totally uh, turn it by thirty degrees to RGB. Yeah, but and you don't have the don't... same color. It's a color gamut thing, right? If you're going to process the image digitally, you may as well use RGB over anything else. If you could use CMYK. Yeah, but, uh, but what, what I'm uh, what I uh, you know with, what um, different yeah. colors you got the extra channels that you can uh, show something else. With can you guys color. see my screen? Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, yeah. but they're not channels, Theodore, because pink isn't a channel. It, it's a combination of everything. So th this, yeah, but this, it can show some. Hang on, hang on. Let, let's Theodore. Simon demo. Let, let me let me let me demonstrate a little bit. So th this is a, pro, a program that we use for processing these kinds of images. It's called Pix Insight. It's a, a, a dedicated astrophotography processing program, and I can work in whichever color space I um, uh, you know happen to choose. And there's ways of pulling out CMYK and so on as well. Uh, uh, you know, cha changing the entire color space. The question is, what value am I getting? So th this is a bad example image because this is a broadband image. This is this is only about an hour and a half. Um, in fact, probably less than that, uh, probably an hour in total um, of something called the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, which I was taking earlier. Um, but, you know, the, the, the final image we want to present, I could have gotten to this stage um, from, you know, lo lots and lots of different ways of processing. So I could, have take, I could, I could take this image um, and I could, um, uh, I'm not sure if you can see the, 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 the secondary windows that I'm, I'm using here, but if I change the hue and I say, okay, I want to look at the hue of this image and I want to change the colors so that they map differently like that, for example. What are you seeing on the screen? Are you seeing all of the... So we're not seeing the secondary window, but we are seeing the impact. We can see the, the result, yeah. 
Right. So what what I'm doing there is I'm just messing with the with 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 uh, using a simple, uh, a rather complicated curves transformation. Um, uh, I don't know why the sharing isn't isn't actually doing what I'd expect it to. Do, but you can you know you can see the difference there. And all I'm doing is I'm remapping the the colours. Now that doesn't really work very well for a broadband image. The reason I'm using the the colours that are here in this broadband image is because the um, uh, the, the 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 broad the the broadband colours that are here. Um, are real colors this is this is um, been mapped using a process called spectrum uh, spectrum uh, spectrographic the pho photospectral color correction or something along those lines I can't remember the actual term um, but if I boost up the saturation a little bit you'll be able to see um, hopefully be able to see oh god I'll reset that um, Try that again. So if I boost up the saturation um, a bit, you should be able to see the the sort of level of blues um, that are in here. Yeah. If I oh, there we go. So you can see the the yeah you know, these are, these are real world colours, and you can see um, uh, that these colours are um, you know the actual real colours. I haven't processed this image probably at all, but that, these are the actual colours of the stars that are there and so on. And this is all um, taken from. Uh, scientific instruments that have measured the real colors of these charts and know what colors they should be so there's a white mapping but if this was a uh, an image which was like i say false color then i can mess with the colors however i want to and it doesn't matter which process i use to get there i can choose a color space at random almost um, because i'm it's, it's just a step on the process to get to the final image does, does that kind of make sense or not yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh what i want to uh, what to point to uh, if you use more filters than just uh, solve for oxygen and hydrogen for, mm -hmm. for example and um, you can use that and uh, nitrogen and uh, a few others uh -huh. absolutely and, yeah and from that start you put more channels in it so you can show more details uh, on a picture ah, that's interesting but the final picture would still yeah it would still use be the but, same yeah it would for, still... for example purple that mm -hmm. there, there is no such way wavelength like purple. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so okay. That, that's that, that's that's uh, could could make another yeah. something that's so, important for astronomers, for example. Yeah. So we we merge things in 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 the in the same kind in 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 that manner. So what we what I do sometimes, for example, is I'll use um, there's a process in this um, astrophotography suite called pixel math. Um, and this is basically being able to do mathematics with di different images and combining them in different ways. So I could say, make the red channel take a percentage of this, um, you know, or d dynamically, pro programmatically, for each pixel. If the hydrogen level of, uh, is, is um, below this, then pull in this section of nitrogen. If it's above this, then pull in that section of oxygen and use that kind of composite creation. And there's there's a whole set of techniques um, that a colleague of mine, one of the other Nina developers actually, um, has uh, pioneered. I can give you a link to his website where he actually talks about it in quite a bit of detail. If it was it's DPP, that, so. you'd call it spot color process. Yeah. I think I get what Theodore's saying. It's a spot color. Absolutely. So you're going to create some maths and do an like an indexed color palette. Yep, that sounds yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. cool. Any other question? I'm conscious of the time. We've, you've you've helped you out. Well, we started with 11 people, you've ended with 12, and we had 16 for the vast majority of the time. So oh, I'm cool. really, really conscious. Yeah, it's just we've been here a while. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's gripping everyone. It really is. I do. It's such what, an interesting. What is thing. the resolution of these pictures? So my camera that I um, uh, take images with nowadays, it, it has uh, 3.76 micron pixels, and it's got about 6,000 by 4,000 of them. Um, and I tend to use a, a technique that comes from uh, the Hubble scientists, again, called drizzle, where um, effectively you're uh, mathematically picking up uh, or, or counting on the fact that seeing means that your pixels move very very slightly in between images um so it actually you uh, i use that kind of technique to actually double the resolution so i end up with about uh, twelve thousand by eight thousand odd pixels um in an image um there's a reason why the pc that i've just built down there has 128 gigs of memory a ryzen uh, 9 5950 um cpu and a, and a whole bunch of ssd in it so just did you ever try or do you have equipment to take anything in x-ray 
Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I no, I've never really played with sort of that kind. I don't even know what frequency X rays are. They'll be higher than what I've got here. Um, X rays sound sound dangerous, although I've had so many of them recently because of my back. Um, we can keep asking questions, but I'm going to have to stand up. Just yeah, for yeah, go for it. I'll just wrap up. What I'll do is I'll wrap up the recording side of stuff so that people can talk a bit more freely. Um, Sorry, Francis. Got quite a few questions running. Quick question. So. I did ask. No, Paul. He's just he's just taking a minute. Yeah, no, no, I think. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me. Questions. I'll just no, no. Stand here. Okay. So yeah, just to wrap up the recording. Obviously, thank you very much, uh, Simon, for for coming this evening. Really appreciate it. Awesome talk. Uh, we'll continue to chat between us now. Um, but I assume people can poke you on Discord if they have questions. Absolutely, yes. Around. Although for the next three days, I'm on a cruise. So <laughs> okay, we're running away. Good time. But apart from cool. that, then yes. Right, I'll hit stop now. The links from the side deck are in the uh, comments below. Um, so please feel free to, to visit them. Cool.